so uh, so there's this uh, ubiquitous growth in banking, and, and it's placing uh, real uh, heavy pressure on the performance of various devices uh, in the uh, in the optical layer. If you will. So speed is going to be important. Uh, cost of fabrication. As the gentleman said, thermal and photochemical uh, stability. And so, with all of those, uh, you have to worry about graphene. Uh, you got to worry about gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide is not the simplest thing to deal with because you got to deal with the right planes, etc., in that structure. Uh, so, in looking at that, and looking at the, the, what we're able to do with structure property changes and effect rates changes with respect to the enzyme. Areas that uh, Dr. Reed uh, laid out today are some of the areas that uh, um, we would have hope. But other than that, I just wouldn't want to speculate. So, but from the standpoint of our company, okay, uh, there's there's undeniable evidence that, that this work we're talking about. And it's something that I practiced all my career, and, and that is turnaround time on testing and feedback loops and tightening. This starts off as a highly empirical uh, type of operation as you get more information and more data. You're able to build first principles uh, around reading, uh, and what the relationship, the structure, uh, and the properties are. And I'm very encouraged by what I see in this. So I think that feedback loop, tightening that feedback loop, and getting real time information is really important to us. Thank you, Dr. Just as Admiral Zellmore seems like a, a great place to go to the military, obviously with your background, just with the space that you just addressed, would you be considering taking on a similar role uh, in, in, that, in that space? So, so my, you know, I'm going to be very careful about how I answer that, right? So, uh, obviously, uh, we have a lot of knowledge about uh, the optical layer, and previous knowledge with respect to that, and a lot of experience in innovation. Uh, a lot of experience on, on how you face activities, uh, and, uh, and hopefully I can bring to bear all that knowledge uh, with respect to uh, the commercialization process that you have to That sounds great. I guess my question is a little bit different than that, though, that uh, with, your, with your background and with your position in quick point, would you be actually doing some or what kind of result was going to actually go in and talk to those companies? So if there's a if there's an opportunity to do that, I will certainly will. Thank you. Can I have that? Thank you very much, Tom. So I'm very pleased to to be with all of you this morning. Uh, if I look uncomfortable, I am. I've been retired for five months, and this is the first time I had a coat and tie on. And actually, my wife forced me to go out and get a haircut. So anyway, uh, uh, I've been really having a good time since I retired from Corning, but also spending a lot of time thinking about this company and, and how we can get to revenue faster and how we can increase value from the standpoint of what we have. And so I'm going to uh, present some frameworks uh, for thought on, on uh, presenting a framework that we use in interacting on your behalf as independent directors with management to talk about how we get greater control out of, over what we manufacture, uh, how we move it forward uh, as, a, as a material based business and how we think about taking this business further into the value chain. Uh, so there's, there's nothing erudite about this, it's kind of just fundamental but I thought it would be really important to share it with, uh, with shareholders. So <clears throat> uh, this is an evolving business model, and uh, as, as, just as a materials business to begin with. And, and uh, in a materials business, I've spent a lot of time in materials businesses, and there are some really common factors and features that are important in developing such a business. And one is, uh, Tom, uh, Tom mentioned, getting greater control over, uh, uh, over the creation of your materials 
and their testing and reducing the feedback loop to get important information to guide you as to where these materials should go. So we have this emerging portfolio that, that uh, Tom Zellabor talked about. Uh, we have university partnerships uh, to help guide us on the uh, determining the efficacy of these materials in a variety of applications. And, and we've created a business model uh, that is, is based upon these existing materials. Uh, and moving those materials into applications that exist and displacing materials that are there today because of the greater efficacy of organic materials. Ultimately moving these materials because of different per performance attributes into uh, markets beyond telecom. And then having the capability to do uh, structure property modification uh, to refine the performance of these materials in their application and, and basically define a, a strong competitive position as competitors try to compete with you with their materials. So what this said is, is we needed to build our own laboratory. Build a laboratory that gives us precise control over the conditions of the synthesis of these really complicated materials. And it also said that we needed to really build a testing capability that provided data that would guide us as to what the performance of our materials would be in these various applications. So we've moved away from uh, you know, a broad set of university partnerships and build a laboratory. We're beginning to build uh, our testing capability to guide us on, on a performance of our materials uh, and critical performance factors in these various devices. And, and, and we're going to be, be able to have the ability then uh, to, to do a lot of structure property modification with rapid feedback cycles so that we're not waiting for months and months and months to get results and then go back into the laboratory and make modifications. Okay, so this is a, a traditional materials-based model, okay? And, and it basically what we're doing is we're compressing our work in a way that we get feedback faster and then we can guide uh, where our materials go with respect to applications. Now, <clears throat> our company is based upon the fact that long-term organics are better than anything else uh, from the standpoint of photonic-based devices. Uh, we have or inorganics uh, uh, and uh, and this is just a two-dimensional graph of faster response and, and ex uh, ch uh, cheaper. Uh, and as you go to the right, obviously cheaper. Inorganics would be uh, lithium niobate, lithium tantalate, indium phosphide, uh, the three five semiconductor compounds, uh, indium ga uh, gallium arsenide, uh, and uh, gallium nitride, and those kinds of compounds. Okay, and and really. Uh, the largest uh, participant as an inorganic in, in, this, in this space is lithium niobate, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Then the move to silicon photonics, and, and this is taking advantage of the semiconductor properties of silicon and also their response to light, okay? And the ability to, to integrate electronic and photonic function on the same chip, and that's an area called silicon photonics, an important area. And then finally, organics. And, and, and uh, uh, this is why we exist. We have this firm belief that organics long term will be faster and they will be cheaper. And they ultimately will provide better, better devices. And better means a smaller form factor, okay, lower cost production uh, because of uh, using uh, less expensive substrates. Uh, uh, higher productive uh, printing processes, less error correction because the reproducibility of excitation and decay to the ground state, much more reproducible, and higher uh, electro-optic activity uh, requiring lower voltage and all the savings that come from that, okay? So materials-based movement uh, uh, from inorganics through silicon photonics into organics 
And, and what that says is, to me, okay, how do we get greater control ourselves over that replacement process? And, and, and ultimately, what it might say is that perhaps we need to make a move in the value chain so that we can control that displacement process better ourselves. Okay, now lithium niobate is an inorganic uh, using, used the, uh, primarily in optical modulators, okay? And you're all familiar with what's happening with respect to bandwidth requirements. And ba bandwidth requirements are increasing. Uh, lithium niobate uh, is, is moving from low speed into higher bandwidth, into 100 gigabits and 40 gigabits per, uh, per second. And if you take a look at this curve in a couple of years, 100 gigabits and 40 gigabits per second uh, will, will, be, uh, will, do will dominate uh, the picture for lithium niobate. That, so if you just look at it as a materials business, it's a small business. But if you look at it uh, as a components business and a subsystems business, it's a hell of a business. It's a big business. And so looking at lithium niobate, materials plus devices, all right, we're talking about a business of about $2 billion today, growing 40% over two years, or 40% or a little less than 40% to $2.65 billion. So that says an awful lot to me anyway about, you know, if you have a wonderful material, if you have an evolution of this market to large size, and as markets grow to such sizes, that people are gonna be looking for better solutions, and better means better performance at less cost, okay? That says an awful lot about how we should take this company to begin not only to build strength in materials, but then to take those materials perhaps further up the value chain into, into uh, components and devices. And so this is the value pyramid, all right? The bottom part of it being materials. Could develop a real nice business here, okay? Probably pretty high profit margin, but relatively small business. And as you moved up on engineering with the, those materials into, into wafers and crystals, and then ultimately into components and into subsystems and, and systems, you uh, obviously build complexity which requires that you're gonna to have to build that capability as a company or, or find a way of developing that capability in partnership with others uh, and, and begin, to move, begin to control the movement of your material uh, uh, in this value chain to create even greater value. So this is the, the discussions on your behalf as independent directors that we're having with management in the company. And it's, it's designed to accelerate our, 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 our move in acceptance of our materials in the marketplace and accelerate our move to create greater value uh, based upon a business that goes beyond materials. So I thought it would be worthwhile, again, nothing esoteric here. I think a lot of you understand it, but share with you uh, uh, what the kind of discussions that we're having on your behalf uh, with management to, to create revenue and then a greater value ultimately. So uh, the train has left the station in a way, okay? And uh, either we uh, wait for acceptance, wait for people to tell us, you know, this looks like a pretty good material, we'll get around to testing it next year, or we take a much more aggressive posture uh, with respect to movement of our, of our materials into devices that perhaps we, we have greater control over. Okay, so that's my presentation. And uh, after Tom is finished, I'll be happy to ask, answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks. Basically, look at it as a, as a semiconductor business. I mean, if you take a look at, just take a look at silicon. For it uh, to be acceptable for performance in semiconductors, it has to be of extraordinary purity and consistency. And the same thing applies here, that, that our materials are going to have to be extremely pure, extremely uniform, and have uh, zero defects in, in, in when, when they're uh, put into thin films, et cetera, to guarantee consistent performance. And you're not going to do that 
with with a with a laboratory, you know, in a two car garage. You're going to have to have a first class lab. You have to invest that money in your lab with the belief that with a first class lab you can control those synthetic conditions day after day after day after day the same way and produce the same material every time. You know, I, I just, I've been asked that question a million times on a million developments. And, and you know, I understand your frustration. Because in, in leading and managing people, I've been similarly frustrated. And, and so if we have good instrumentation, if, if Babu is in the lab, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, <laughs> and Chuck is there doing all the testing, and you have a startup, Again, a, a startup mentality to control exactly those conditions, and you can analyze exactly what you got. You know, we should be able to zero in on this thing pretty quickly. But I can't tell you whether that's six months or how long that is. All right, but but you got to have that infrastructure in place to give yourself a chance. Other other otherwise, it's just kind of hit and miss. And she's, you know, it works today. Now I wonder what happened today that you know I changed that kind of stuff. So you got to keep precise records, have precise analytical uh, analysis. Uh, University of Colorado is developing the material themselves. No, they're not doing the material themselves. It's our material. They are device people. And, and, and just testing. like Dave said, or somebody said, you know, they really have a first-class capability to make their devices the same way every time under very controlled conditions. However, them with a stable enough of material to so, make their product. So our goal is to is to get there. Yeah. And once we get there, I'll tell you what, that's going to be an extraordinary strong partnership that's going to give us a lot of guidance here. Right. Speaking uh, on it uh, from the material standpoint, um, so these are very, very, from, from the standpoint of the structure of the polymer itself, it's pretty sophisticated. Uh, then new degrees of freedom have been opened from the standpoint of being able to blend and alloy various other uh, parts of a, of, a, of a system that, uh, that then gives you a performance uh, uh, map, right? So you have, uh, you have a whole variety of degrees of freedom from the standpoint of the design of, of the polymer system and the matrix within which it's going to sit, right? And so you have to be very careful on this, uh, on how you construct your intellectual property, because it can be reverse engineered, you know, and you, so you got to be careful about how you do this. Uh, so one is always uh, have a successful uh, application development with a partner and indicate to the partner that there's continuous ways to improve performance, right, that you have the capability to do that. And so it's not only... Uh, the initial uh, system, it's the pathway to even getting better performance. And when you have a laboratory that can do this with multiple degrees of freedom and understand then the relationships to electro-optical uh, properties, uh, then uh, I think you can have a much more secure competitive position. Because once this becomes visible, more visible, and as Siraj says, once we get it into some systems, then, then everybody's going to be you know, scrutinizing everything that we did. So we just have to be faster, quicker, and, and actually more innovative from, from the standpoint of the relationships of those polymer systems. And it, we're, we, as Tom said, we've built that capability to do that now. Thanks, Joe.